Give God a hand clap of praise, everybody. You can do better than that. Give God praise. Sitting at home, you should praise God. Why? Because I believe that the best is still yet to come. One more time, if you believe that, give God praise. Listen, you guys can sit down, sit down, man. I'm super, super excited about all that God is doing uh, in the life of our church and pastor. Can we thank God for Pastor Mike McClure Jr.? Sir, we love you, we honor you. You and Lady J, all that God is doing in and through your lives. We're still celebrating the Stellars, new music. And uh, here's what I love. I believe that what you see God do through your leader is a sign and a symbol of what he wants to do in you, right? And so when I rejoice and I thank God for what I see him doing in his life, I believe I'm catching a sneak peek <laughs> at what he wants to do in my life as well. And so I'm excited because I see homes, I see marriages, I see businesses, I see degrees and scholarships. Somebody should shout, I receive that. Exodus chapter 13, just two verses, verse 17 and 18. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, Exodus chapter 13. This is undoubtedly one of my favorite pieces of scripture, Exodus chapter 13. And I want to rest in verse 17 and 18. Are y'all ready? ready? Are you ready? Yes. This is what it says. When Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road <laughs> that runs through Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route to the promised land. God said if the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds <laughs> and return to Egypt. Verse 18. So God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Thus the Israelites left Egypt like an army ready for battle. Here's how I want to tag this text as we begin our time together today. Look at somebody, if you can, ask somebody, tag somebody in the comment section, ask them this question. Is this the right way? Is this the right way? I want to jump into this. Here's a valuable truth that I want to communicate early in my message today. That the authentic you does not require your perfection, but it will require your freedom. I want to say that again. You being who God has called you to be, you becoming that business owner, you becoming that man, that woman of God, that husband, that wife, that entrepreneur, uh, that, that politician, that teacher, that doctor, that nurse, whatever it may be, that minister, that prayer warrior, whatever God has called you to do, it will not require your perfection, but it will require your freedom. I really want you to receive this because I believe that I'm talking early in my message to maybe a couple thousand people who can say, Pastor Hollis, I've never been perfect, but I thank God I'm free. I think I'm in the wrong house. I haven't dotted every I, I have not crossed every T, but I thank God for his grace and his mercy because it set me free. I thank God for what he did on Calvary's cross because it didn't make me perfect, but it did make me free. I believe that God is a God who is undoubtedly interested and invested not only in our elevation, but also in our liberation. I think I'm talking too good. That yes, God wants to elevate you, but he's also interested and invested in liberating you. Because what good is it for him to elevate you until he liberates you? <laughs> because if you don't get free before you go high, then you ultimately end back in whatever you in in the first place. Y'all not listen to me. So yes, God wants to elevate you, but before he elevates you, he says, first, let me liberate you. Why? So that way you cannot just go there, but stay there. I think I'm in the wrong house. I don't want to just visit the next level. No, I want to rest at the next level. I want to live at the next level. I don't want to go out of town and vacation in a better house than the one that I call home. No, I want to live in it. And what good is it for you to elevate momentarily to a certain level only to end up having to come back down? Why? Because you never got free. Your purpose will not require your perfection, but it will require your freedom. Somebody shout, I'm free. Put that in the comment section, shout, I'm free.
My Bible tells me that he who the son sets free is free indeed. It don't matter what I did. It doesn't matter where I was. It doesn't matter who I did it with. Because once God gave me freedom, there is nothing the devil can do to take it away. Right? If you're going to be who God has called you to be, you don't have to be perfect, but you do have to be free. And we serve a God who can free us from drug abuse, generational curses, pornography, alcoholism, uh uh-oh, bad attitudes, (laughs) saying stuff to people that you ultimately regret. regret. But in my walk with God, slide your feet back. (laughs) In my walk with God, I've learned that it's most difficult for God to free you from yourself. (laughs) <laughs> he can free you from drug addiction. He can free you from, from alcoholism, pornography, anything and everything. But one of the most difficult things to happen and occur in your life is for God to free you from you. Come on. Right? Because in order for God to free you from you, he doesn't have to tell it to let you go. Mm. He's got to tell you to let you go. And many of us are still stuck and stagnant, not because it wouldn't let us go, but because we wouldn't let us go. I come against every spirit of self-sabotage. I come against the spirit of cycles that keep you going in and out of the same season over and over again. Maybe this is why the Apostle Paul wrote and said, the good that I would do, I do it not, for I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is always present with me. He says, I want to do good. But there's something about me that keeps me trapped in the same spot. He said, I want to do right, but then there's a part inside of me, even though I want to do what I should do, there's a part of me that keeps making me do what I don't need to do. And even though I want to take two steps forward, me keep dragging me two steps backwards. Am I preaching? Right? And the Bible is inundated with instances that support this statement. That most notably, so in the lives of the children of Israel, that God says, before I can elevate you, I got to liberate you. Right? He says, yeah, I want to I wanna elevate you. I want to I wanna take you to a land that is flowing with milk and honey, what eyes haven't seen and what ears haven't heard. He says, but if I don't liberate you first, then the elevation will do you no good. When, when, when we meet them in, in Exodus chapter 13, uh, God is leading them out of Egypt into the promised land, right? Here's what I noticed first, that God has gotten them out of Egypt, but he has not gotten Egypt out of them. Can I talk just for a moment? He's gotten them out of Egypt, but there's still a lot of Egypt in them. Hmm, what, what, what do I do when God has gotten me out of my past? But if you say the wrong thing to me, it triggers the past that's still in me to come back up. He says, no, I've gotten you out of Egypt, but I've got to get, I've got to get Egypt out of you. G- G- God says, look at what but the Bible says in Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. When Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road. Somebody shout main. He did not lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route to the promised land. All right? So what God says is, I'm getting ready to bring you out but I'm gonna take you on a detour, all right? I wanna teach you something. Dr. Tony Evans says in his book, Detours, he defines them as an unexpected shift in the preferred route to a desired destination. I wanna give that to you again, put that in your notes. A detour is an unexpected shift, an unexpected shift in the preferred route to a desired destination. Right? You've got a destination that you desire, but you've also got a route you prefer. Ha! Preach Hollis. You know where, you, not only do you know where you want to go, but you also know how you want to get there. <laughs> but what God does is, He says, I'm getting ready to take you where you want to go, but I might take you away. Y'all, y'all not hearing me today. He says, the, the first reason why I've got to do this. Is because I've gotten you out of Egypt, but I haven't gotten Egypt out of you. Put this in your phone, put this in your notes, put this in the comment section. The first reason why we see the necessity of a detour is because a detour is for detox. 
Can, can I talk about it? A detour is for detox. Sometimes God takes you the long way around because he says there's some stuff inside of you that I've got to get out of you. Because if I let you go where you're going with that still inside of you, you'll ruin and pervert with the opportunity that I'm trying to present you with because there's still something inside of you. God, I'm preaching to somebody. I'll preach to myself. There's things that I'm praying and asking God for that he's saying, Hollis, I love you and your favor and your gifted and your call, but I can't give you that yet because you still got some of you in you that I got to get out. Because if I don't, I will, I, will, I will birth in you an opportunity that the old you will abort. <laughs> You ever had a coworker who always complained about why they couldn't get a promotion? And you're just looking at them like, uh-huh, so you, you feel like they're discriminating against you, huh? You don't think it had anything to do with the, the 17 tardies that you got? <laughs> you don't think maybe you got to overlook for this opportunity, uh, maybe because you, you, know, you get an attitude with your supervisor all the time? You don't think that has anything to do with why you're trapped in this position? says no I, it would it would be it would be it would be it would be uh irresponsible of me to elevate you and promote you until i first detox you detox shout out to pastor darius he taught an incredible message last week entitled six types of toxic people there's some stuff in you that you've got to get out of you right uh oh, Jesus, help me. Because I figured something out about a detox, and I pray this blesses you, that a detox may not get everything out, but it will lower the levels of toxicity in you. It may not get all of the toxins out, but it will lower the level of toxins, all right? Can I tell somebody who's watching me right now, you may be struggling with something today that you might still be struggling with tomorrow. But what God wants to do is, is on the pathway to getting it out, he may want to reduce the levels, the dependence that you have on it. Can I talk to somebody? It, it, even, he says, he says, when Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route to the promised land. God is getting ready to bring them out of Egypt, but he's not going to use the path that they expect. All right. Here's something I want you to put in your phone. You cannot fulfill God's will your way. I'm preaching to me. I pray you can get something out of it. Hollis, you cannot fulfill God's will your way. We are the only people who will go to God and pray, ask for what we want, and then tell God how to do it. <laughs> God, I want this and that, and I want it by then, and I don't want these people to know about it. <laughs> no, you cannot fulfill God's will your way. Can I bless you with something? I pray this helps you. Many of us are not resisting the will. We're resisting the way. Wow. Wow. <laughs> We're not resisting what God wants to do. We're resisting how he wants to do what he wants to do. Can I tell you that's why certain people don't like you? It's not simply what you're doing. It's simply the fact they didn't think you would be the one to do it. That's why you can walk in the office and you ain't saying nothing to nobody. You minding your own business. Mm, there she go. Who she thinks she is. I don't know who I think I am. I'm just trying to do what God has called me to do. There are certain places you will never fit in. Why? Because people are not irritated by what God is doing. They're more irritated by the fact that he decided to use you. Baby, you mad and upset about some favor that I wish I could give back. I didn't ask for this. I didn't beg for this. But when God puts his favor and his anointing on your life, many of us are not resisting the will. We're resisting the way. We are not arguing over what we are not attempting to argue with God over what he's doing. But rather, we're upset over the way he decided to do it. Ah, you, you, you're upset about the way. You always wanted to be an entrepreneur. You're not mad about the will, but you are upset that you had to get laid off to do it. That's the way. You wanted more peace, 
But you didn't want to lose those same toxic friends that you had been holding on to. And when God pulled them out of your life, you didn't know if to shout about the peace or to cry because you were by yourself. Because we are not upset about the will. It's the way. <laughs> it's the way. This is, this is why you got to be careful because we say stuff in church we don't mean. Anyway, you bless me. You a lie. You're not satisfied because you're not, if you wanted what you wanted and you wanted the way that you wanted. And God is trying to tell some of us today that you cannot pray for something and then tell me how to send it. Can't nobody tell you nothing, but you need wisdom. <laughs> you need support, but you won't open up your mouth and ask somebody for it. <sighs> Y'all don't like me. All right. The detour is for detox, all right? Number two, the, the number one, the detour is for detox. Number two, all right? There's something else about detours. I need you to write this down. Detours are not desired. <laughs> detours are not desired, all right? Th th this is why this, this way and this will piece kind of messes me up because uh, when you wake up in the morning and you're getting ready to start your morning commute, one of the most irritating frustrating things that can possibly happen is for you to find out you've got to take a detour. Yeah. Yeah. Man, y'all can't drive. What's going on, man? Because you want to get to work. You want to get, you want to get to church. You want to get to wherever you got to go the way you are accustomed to. The way that's, that's comfortable. The, w the way that you were taught. The way that was preferred. Nobody desires a detour. Yeah, <laughs> when you see those lights flashing ahead, you get upset, <laughs> right? Here's something I learned because Exodus 13 and 17 shows me not only that detours aren't desired, but also, number three, that detours are designed. <laughs> this is good, right? Just because you're on a path that you don't desire, that does not mean that it's a path that God didn't design. I got to say that again. Just because you're on a path that you don't desire does not mean it's a path that God did not design. It is possible for you to be on a journey that does not match your desire, but does match his design. Y'all not hearing me. There is some stuff going on in your life right now that you did not ask for. But can I suggest to you that God might have designed it? When you start praying about what 2021 would look like, you didn't ask for a Delta variant. You didn't ask for heartbreak. You didn't ask for pain. But is it possible that even though you do not desire it, that God still designed it? This is why the Bible says stuff, and we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who, not the things that you desire, but all things. Not the things you prefer, but all things. Not the things you want, but all things. God does not need your desire for it to match his design. <laughs> he doesn't need it. We are some of the most arrogant, self-centered people who get so caught up on what we want that we arrogantly assume that God cannot move in a way that doesn't match what you want. Hmm. <laughs> Y'all gonna click off the stream, please don't. How arrogant are we to assume that God is limited to only working in what you manifested? Whatever that is. <laughs> that God is only limited to working in a way that you're familiar with. Well, he didn't do it for my grandmama. And he didn't do it. Oh, God. See, we pray for stuff and don't even realize what comes with the prayer. Right. God, I'm, I'm a generational break, curse break. I'm, I'm going to be the first in my family to do yada, yada, yada. And then you run from the persecution that comes with being first. You run from the pain that comes with doing something that nobody else in your bloodline has done before. And God is trying to get you. I am not limited to using you in the way that I use her. I'm not limited to using you in the same way I've used who you look for on YouTube. <laughs> the desire 
does not dictate the design. That's what I'm trying to get you to realize. It is possible for you to have a desire and then not match God's design. We got to stop calling stuff demonic because you didn't want it. <laughs> you got to stop. It is possible for God to do something in your life that does not match what you do. Here's, here's, here's what we really should be thankful for. Because if God gave you everything that you desire, y'all, y'all playing with me. Y'all, y'all playing with me. I'm getting ready to go. If God gave you everything you wanted, if God had let you date everybody who number you asked for, if God had let you get every job you apply, if he had let you move into every apartment that you wanted, if he let you get approved for every car that you ever applied, there are some things that we should be thankful that God did not allow us to get what we desire. God, I thank you that there are some desires that you declined. Y'all don't hear me. I thank God that there are some desires that you declined because there was some stuff that Hollis wanted that truth be told wasn't good for me. Y'all don't hear me. Y'all don't hear me. Y'all don't hear me. All right. Here's something I want to give you. Okay. God help me. Verse 17 says, even though that was the shortest route to the promised land, the short, somebody shout shortest. The shortest route, put that in the chat, shortest route to the promised land, all right? Here, the writer is is drawing a a distinction, a a dichotomy between, um, between, how do I want to say this, between a detour and a shortcut. Mm. Between a detour and a shortcut, all right? He's trying to get us to understand that that, that there's a difference between you taking a detour and you taking a shortcut, right? Because a shortcut gets you there faster, but a detour gets you there better. See, see, there's somebody, there's somebody who got there before you, but they're not gonna get there in as good of a condition and, and in their right mind, and, and they and they still love their kids, and, and they got there, but now you don't like nobody who was riding with you on the way there. What good is it for me to get there and then to not get there in good condition? I don't want to limp to the next level. Y'all, y'all not here. I don't want to limp to the next level. See, 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 you're trying to be first. When God says, no, I want you to be best. I don't want you to get there faster. I want you to get there better. There's plenty of people who are getting there, but what condition are they in when they show up? No, when I finally get the opportunity that I've been praying for, I want to be able to stand proudly. I want to be able to stand flat-footed. I want to look good. I want to sound good. I want it to be clear that I've been spending time with God. I don't want to limp into the next level. You're in such a rush. And look at you. Now you just, you just limping. You just, I- I- any way I can get there, I get there. Whoever I got to talk about, whoever I got to stab in the back, whoever I got to betray, as long as I can get there, I can get there. And now your mind is so messed up that you can't even enjoy what you've been working for all this while because you got there in a rush. Can I tell you something? I told you this before. You can't rush. Why? Because when you rush, you ruin it. <laughs> you're in such a rush that you don't even realize you're ruining what God is attempting to do in your life. A shortcut gets you there faster, but a detour gets you there better. All right. Can I, can, can I, can I help you? Can I help you? A shortcut is a route that you found, <laughs> but a detour is a route that has been planned. All right. See, you, you stumble upon a shortcut. Girl, I was headed down to the store, yada, yada, yada. I bust the left. I didn't even know they brought you out on First Avenue. You just found that, right? But when a detour occurs, somebody who works for the city, they go out and they begin to survey the road. They say, okay, we got to fix this section of the street, all right? So in order to make sure that people who are trying to get from point A to point B are not impacted by what we're working on here, we're going to plan an alternative route that will get there safely and about the same time that they normally would have, right? And what you don't realize is is that you keep trying to get there the shortest way possible when you don't realize God is designing a detour that will get you there safe and sound in the way that he planned it. Can I tell somebody that God is planning your detour? Y'all don't know when to shout. God is planning your detour. Right? A shortcut might be the shortest route, 
but it's not always the best route. All right. And when God takes them the long way, he's practicing something I want to call, I pray you can handle this, something I want to call, Pastor James, pain prevention. He's practicing something I like to call pain prevention. Shout out to my father. I remember years ago, my dad sat me down. I was 16 years old. I did something crazy. And uh, he looked at me in the face. He said, Pastor James, he said, he said son, caution is better than cure. Caution is better than cure. Every once in a while when I'm on the phone talking to him, I just say, Pops, caution is better than cure. What he was attempting to communicate to his son to his seed is, is that, son, I would rather you take your time rather than you rush only for us to have to go back and try to cure what you messed up. He's practicing pain prevention. Right? I'm not making this up. Y'all know we preach out of the Bible here. Look at verse, verse 17. Throw that back on the screen for me if you don't mind. It says, when Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route. But why? God said, if the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and return back to Egypt. He's preventing potential pain. There is something that they are in a rush to get to and don't understand that there is something waiting on them that they're not ready for. I got to go because y'all, y'all missing me. There's something waiting on you. You're in such a rush to get there and you don't realize that there's an enemy waiting on you around the corner that you don't have any experience with. Why? Because you've been in captivity all these years. You've never had any military training. You don't know how to fight. You don't know what you're doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to prevent your pain by taking you a path that you didn't prefer. This is why you've got to be careful when you argue with God over the path that he picks. You got to be careful when you argue with him over the path that he picks for you. <laughs> because you can see to the corner. He can see around it. Y'all, y'all don't hear me. You can see to the corner, but he can see around the corner. And he knows there's something waiting on you that you are not prepared for. He's preventing pain. All right. Here's a question I want to ask you. And uh, I want you to ask yourself this question in the chat, in the room. How much of your pain? (laughs) How much of your pain could have been prevented? You wanted them so bad. I just want them so bad. (laughs) You, You just you just wanted to go to the club that night so bad. You, you just wanted to be able to drive that car and everybody see you in it so bad. And you didn't realize that there was pain attached to it that could have been prevented. If I sign for this, maybe they'll stay with me. Pain that could have been prevented. Man, my mama not going to be talking to me any kind of way. I'm about to leave, get my own apartment. Pain. That could have been prevented. Man, I'm tired of seeing everybody else driving nice and loud. I'm in college trying to get this degree, but forget it, I'm going to drop out. Pain that could have been prevented. Pain that could have been prevented. And what God is trying to realize, get them to realize is, is that if you follow the path that I pick, it can prevent you some pain. God said that the people are faced with the battle, they might change their minds. I like that. Change their minds. Am I doing all right? They may change their minds. All right. God knew the shortest route would force them to have to fight before they were ready. All right. And he's looking at them saying, y'all don't have any military experience. If you are faced with an enemy, you're going to change your mind. You're going to get intimidated. You're going to get scared and you're going to run. So they'll change their minds and go back to Egypt. <laughs> Ch- change their minds. I-, I-, I was tripping church because I- I- that change your mind phrase, it just wouldn't leave me alone. I kept trying to figure out, God, what are you trying to show me in this? And what he said to me is, he said, Hollis, I, I was t- instructing Moses to lead them in such a way because I needed them to understand that they could never win a battle with their hands that they had already lost in their head. It is impossible 
for them to win a battle with their hands that they had already lost in their head. When you see the enemy, you're not ready for it. And so you're going to turn and run. You're not even going to fight. So we don't even know if you can win because in your mind, you already lost. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And what I need you to realize is, is that many of us, because we're in such a rush to jump out there, we don't even realize there's something that we are not ready for. And God doesn't want us to fight a battle that we'll lose mentally before we can fight physically. This is what the Bible tells us to be renewed in our mind, right? This is what the Bible, the Bible says, if I keep my mind stayed on him. Why? Because it's trying to get us to realize there's a lot of stuff that's happening up here that's impacting what's going on around there. And you are trying to win battles externally that you are losing internally. Can I tell you, can I give you, can I give you a secret? And I pray y'all don't judge me. Can I give you a secret? I'll never be better up here than I am in here. I remember when I first started preaching, I thought it was all about what I said and how I said it and what commentaries I read and and what pastors I could imitate. And and God trains us and teaches us and helps us understand that you can lose a battle internally and then still be foolish enough to try to win it externally. God literally had to consider that the people he was attempting to liberate and elevate might change their mind and go back to bondage. All right, here's another question I want to ask you. Sometimes it's not about giving the right answers. It's about asking the right questions, all right? Here's what I want to ask you. What made you change your mind? Can I sit that in your lap? What made you change your mind? What made you change your mind? What happened in your life? What jumped off? What, what popped up that made you change your mind? Because God says you were the head and not the tail. What made you change your mind? You're the lender and not the bar. What made you change? You're blessed when you come and you're blessed when you go. What made you change your mind? Because you're allowing people to treat you on a level that is less than what God has already said about you. What made you change your mind? What made you change your mind? All right, I I had to get inside this text for a minute because the Israelites leave Egypt (laughs) And they're on an emotional high. All right. They've seen God do signs and wonders. River Nile turns to blood. Firstborn in every household. Man and cattle. Man and animals killed. They see amazing locusts. They see, they see crazy things. They see a, a staff turn into a stick. And then a, sti- a stick turn into a snake. And then a snake turn back into the staff. They see God do amazing things. They see signs and wonders. Amazing things. They see plagues and plunder. Mm. I did some research. Exodus chapter 12, verse 36. The Lord caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the Israelites and they gave the Israelites whatever they asked for. So they stripped the Egyptians of their wealth. All right. Now, I, I, could, I could really debunk this, this, this counterintuitive notion that you can be repentant uh, about enslaving a people and not pay for it. Yeah, y'all didn't catch what I just said. It's impossible for you to be truly repentant, America, about enslaving a people, but then refuse to pay for it. All right. But I, I, I'll have time for that. All right. In other words, what they're saying is, is, is that we're so sorry for how we treated y'all. God has moved on our hearts in such a way you can take whatever you want. <laughs> now, not only am I going to set you free, but you're going to leave with the stuff that you've been working for that they wouldn't give you. Y'all, y'all don't like me. They've seen signs and wonders, plagues and plunder. So when they leave, they leave in which stuff? Yeah, yeah. That's good. <laughs> they're, they're not leaving by, by themselves. No, they're leaving with stuff. And God says, even with all of that, I know you'll still change your mind on me. <laughs> you ever met somebody no matter what you gave them? <laughs> there was no telling when they changed their mind about you (laughs) here's where I want to hang my hat I'm done detours are for our development 
Detours are for detox. <laughs> detours aren't desired, but they are designed. But then lastly, detours are for our development. Yeah. All right. God says you left on an emotional high. You got all this stuff with you. You're excited about it. You, 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 you're ready to go. And you, God, take us straight there. No, we ready. We got favor. It's on us. It's on my life from the crown of my head to the soles of our feet. This, this take me straight there to the promised land. And God says, no, I got to take you the long way because you made an emotional decision to follow Moses. All right? And what he's trying to get us to realize is, is that it's impossible for you to use emotions to make a decision and to maintain a decision. It is impossible for you to use the same emotions that made the decision to help you maintain the decision. Y'all don't hear me. Emotions are not enough for you to maintain your decisions. No, he says, no, I got to develop you. Because you need some discipline. You need some devotion. You need some faith. You, you need some, some stick to it in this. You need to be able to, to be faced with opposition and still not give up. And emotions won't help you maintain a decision. That's part of the reason why I thank God for the pandemic. <laughs> because some of us came to church and we got high. <laughs> we, we, we came to church and, and, and we got this this ecclesiastical opium. And you ran to the front and you talked about how your life was going to change and you meant it. I'm not beating you up for that. I've, I've done the same thing. But what God says is on the other side of the emotion that helped you make the decision, you've got to submit yourself to my path so I can develop your devotion. And your discipline because emotion can help you make the decision but discipline is what's gonna help you maintain it is this the right way is this the right way I'm making emotional decisions every time somebody makes me upset pastor Hollis I shout and I say something I regret this can't be the right way I'm pouring my heart into people and all the signs are there that they are incapable of giving me anything I deserve in return. Is this, is this the right way? I, I tried to do it the right way. It was taking too long. So Pastor Hollis, I just bust a move and I, I just had to do what I had to do. I took a shortcut. But now I'm sitting there thinking, is this the right way? <laughs> I'm done. I have a seven-year-old daughter, Ava, and she's got to be the smartest seven-year-old I ever met. I know everybody says that about their kids, but whatever. <laughs> what I like about her is, is the attention she pays to detail. We're driving down the street in the car the other day, and um, I was bringing her home and I took a route that she wasn't used to. Normally we always bust the same left, the same right, we go down the same back road. This time I, I went the long way. 10, 15 minutes into the ride, she said, hey daddy, is this the right way? See, yeah, baby, it's, it's the right way. She put her head back down on her iPad and we kept going. And five minutes later, she, she looked back up and she said, Daddy, is this the right way? I said, Ava, you, you, you've asked me that twice. What, what you, you don't think you, <laughs> I know what I'm doing? She said, well, Daddy, this doesn't look like the way we normally go. So I just figured maybe this wasn't the right way. And in an instance, I was convicted because I thought to myself, how many times do we do that to God? 
God, this don't look like the way I, I, I want to go. This, 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 ain't, I, this ain't what I asked for. This, are you sure this is the right way? Are you sure this is the way that you wanted me? Is this the way this was really supposed to work out? Eventually, Ava stopped asking me, was this the right way? Because I believe she made a decision not to trust what she knew or what she expected, but to trust her daddy. And what I'm asking you to do today is to trust your daddy. Trust the, the lawyer that's never lost a case, the doctor that's never lost a patient. Trust your father in heaven that he's in control. And even if you don't like the path, he still got something planned. Father, we ask in Jesus' name that you would give us a supernatural deposit of faith that will allow us to look uncertainty in the eye and say, God, I still trust you. God, I still love you. That God, even if the route isn't what we picked and it's not what we preferred, maybe it is what will prepare us to be what eyes have not seen and what ears have not heard. Father, I lead us as a spiritual big brother in this movement, this reformation, into a moment of repentance. That God, we repent for challenging and, and questioning and, and dragging and kicking against what you wanted to do. Because it didn't look like what we wanted. So according to Psalms 51 and 10, creating us a clean heart and renewing us the right spirit so that we can trust not just in you being the God of the result but also the God of the route and we know that you'll never leave us and you'll never forsake us it's in Jesus name we pray everybody who believed it said amen come on and let's give God praise come on stand to your feet and help me praise God all over the building even at home stand up on your feet and praise God in your kitchen in your living room your bedroom wherever you are I want you to praise God. I believe that somebody's getting ready to make a decision for Christ. If you listen to that message and you're making a decision to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to text HOME to 28950. It's right there on the screen. Text HOME to 28950. We have a team that's waiting to hear from you. We cannot wait to welcome you into our community. We are not a perfect church, but we are a free church. Because the Bible says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. And so I believe that this is a place for you to be free. And who the Son has set free is free indeed. So again, if you're making a decision to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, maybe you're rededicating your life or you want to join Rock City. This is the place that God has told you you should be. The text home to 28950. If you're giving today, you know how to do that. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. There's three ways you can give. It's right there on the screen. You can text to give. You can use Cash App or you can visit our website. When you give here, you don't just give to your church. You give through your church. You allow us to go out into the community and do amazing things. Man, last year in the middle of a pandemic, we were able to gift uh, 1.8, over $1.8 million. Come on, let's give God a hand clap of praise for that. We were able to have a $1.8 million impact in our communities in Birmingham, Tuscaloosa, and around the world. None of that is possible unless you continue to partner with us. So thank you for your giving. Listen, I'm excited about what all God is doing here at Rock City, and I expect for him to keep on doing amazing things. Listen, on behalf of Pastor Mike, Lady J, all of us here at Rock City, we love you. We're praying for you, and we can't wait to see you soon. You guys be blessed. Peace.